So I'm going to talk about three um, case studies of big problems that, uh, that I've spent part of my career working on, and also three of the major pitfalls into which we can fall when we try to address them. And the title of the talk is, you know, how do we create better health at scale? So I'm going to start with uh, one with an analogy. This right here is the NBA record of a particular team starting in 2008 up until 2016. You can see the number of wins and losses in the winning percentage. You can see something happened to this NBA team in those intervening years. Anybody out there, if you want to just yell out, what, am I, what is being depicted right here? Say the name of the player. LeBron James. This is what happened to the Cleveland Cavaliers when LeBron James left in 2010, and then what happened when he came back to the city in 2014. What's interesting about this is that a single player had a dramatic impact on an entire team to the extent that they went from, again, being one of the best teams to the worst teams and back to being one of the best teams again. This is actually a very important lesson because this is conventionally how we think about medical care. We often think about superstars. It's the high utilizers. It's the sort of single answer that's going to fix everything. I would argue, as we talked about, vaccination, getting vaccination rates up, that's a LeBron James problem. You have something which is radically going to make things better. Even potentially reducing infection rates. It's a highly controlled setting. You focus on it, you bring in your superstar players, you make that better. It's a LeBron James problem. I want to contrast it with this. This is a shot from uh, the uh, Sports Center on ESPN about a year ago. This is the women's Olympic soccer team when the U.S. played Sweden. And you can see here what happened in this game. The U.S. took 26 shots on goal compared to Sweden that took three. They had possessed the ball 63% of the time in the game, and yet they lost. What happened? Why did this occur? Every single statistic predicted that the U.S. would win this game. The reason is that soccer is a different problem. It is not a game like basketball. Think about what has to happen in soccer. The goalie has to defend the ball. You have to get it to your back defenders, then to the midfielders, then up to your offensive players, and then actually score a goal. It is a much more complex problem that relies on multiple links of the chain. What is that? What is the analogy in healthcare? And the analogy is this is the world in which to, which, into which we are going. When we talk about social determinants of health or complex chronic disease, those are soccer problems. They are not basketball problems. They require a much greater degree of integration and teamwork. This is something that some people have referred to as a weak link versus a strong link series of problems. And what I'm arguing is that the major problems affecting us in healthcare are going to be weak link problems, not strong link ones. So how do we address them? And the biggest one and the first case study I want to talk about in this analogy is the problem of preventing type 2 diabetes. A massive problem among Americans today, increasing and a huge driver of medical expense and human misery. And yet, let's take an example, let's look at something. This is the results from the Center for Disease Control randomized trial of the Diabetes Prevention Program done in the early 2000s. This is a lifestyle modification program. I work at uh, United, uh, at Optum Labs, which is part of Optum, which is part of United Health Group. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as a technology company. But what the Diabetes Pre Prevention Program demonstrates is that the most powerful technology in healthcare today is often the technology without wires. This is about how did you make connections with patients? How did you get to know them? How do you motivate them? And look at that, 10 years after randomization, significantly improved rates of reduction and progression of type 2 diabetes. And yet, most payers in the country don't pay for this. Why? because the benefits of the care are outside the window for which they actually realize the economic benefits. And this applies not only to private payers, but to the federal government. So the problem, the first problem we tried to solve was how do we get the diabetes prevention program paid for on a national level? Everybody loves this idea, almost nobody pays for it. That's a problem we needed to solve. How do we get there? Well, it turns out that we talk about innovation a lot. And again, I think one of the things to think about is that innovation can also be regulatory innovation. It is legal innovation. It's statutory innovation. And one of those in particular was when I was at CMS with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. One of the key features of that was that through statutory policy, if programs were funded there and you were able to show that they saved money 
or improve quality, or ideally some combination of both while keeping the other one stable, that then the federal government through Medicare had the rulemaking authority to change Medicare policy. And a variety of regulations were waived so we could do those experiments. And one of those experiments was a small amount of money, a couple million dollars given to the YMCA of the United States to study the diabetes prevention program. This is, and uh, I, um, the group that I ran, one of our projects was overseeing that grant. This is the RTI uh, evaluation report findings of the first eight quarters of the diabetes prevention program looking at total cost of care. For those individuals looking at Medicare fee-for-service in a matched um, a com a community comparison group, showing the costs were somewhat better. We looked at this and we said, sent Medicare has to date not been successful. The, the barrier to showing something is actuarially sound is incredibly high. It is very hard to get individuals to sign up to say things are cost saving or improving quality. But this substantially it seemed to lower costs. So getting back to the soccer analogy, how could we create a program that both the chief medical officer and the head actuary at CMS could say are actuarially certified to meet those goals so that we could then expand this nationally. What we did is the following. In our group, we created a specific payment model. So I want you to think back to that soccer analogy. It's not just about one player. It's about getting the ball from one to the next to the next. And oftentimes, we fail to really get into the arcane details of payment policy. I would encourage us when we talk about value to understand that on a very deep level. All the decisions today are made at that granular level. And that understanding is critical. So these are the actual numbers we designed for how much how we'd get that ball from, all, from one end of the field to the other. If a patient attended one session, the provider got paid $25. They got four sessions, they got another $50. They got nine sessions, $100 more. And then on and on. And if they actually achieved weight loss, you got $160. And if you maintained weight loss, the payment continued uh, over the life of that patient being enrolled in the program here. So this was that sort of soccer analogy. It is fitting a payment model to fit a specific model of care. And then once we put that all together, we convened a team, the actuary said, this looks great, we're gonna go back, we're on board. The chief medical officer, a, a terrific individual who ran CMMI for many years, who recently left, um, uh, ruled that this was improving quality. The actuaries came back to us and said, we have a problem. This is just over a year ago. Yep, uh, we think this is great, the first eight quarters are good, but we have this problem, which is that people tend to live longer if they don't get diabetes. If you live longer, you cost more. And it turns out that actuarially speaking, it was gonna be more expensive to have people survive with type two diabetes. And so the actuary said they would not be able to certify that for expansion in Medicare. That is a tough problem to solve. <laughs> so I want to point out before we move on, how do we make that better? How would you, just give yourself 10 seconds, how would you solve that problem? What is the regulatory innovation you could put out there in an existing statutory framework? And we did something very simple. We convened a group together, meaning three people, uh, wrote up a couple of paragraphs, and this is where leadership and personal relationships is so important. Working with our chief medical officer, the head of the Innovation Center, people who were philosophically aligned about what the values of CMS are, we wrote a two-paragraph memo. This is the entirety of the memo, which was posted last year, along with the actuarial note that certified the diabetes program, prevention program for expansion on a federal level. It's a little hard to see, but I'm going to read the last sentence to you here. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has made a determination that costs associated with expected improvements in longevity are not appropriate for consideration in the evaluation of net program spending. In that simple sentence, that is a value judgment. We are better than that. We actually will not count extra years of life as a cost. And this is now Medicare's actuarial policy. So the last lesson before we move on is that, yep, it's all about soccer, but sometimes at the end you just have to get into a football analogy, move the goalpost. <laughs> Next year, uh, this has gone through rulemaking. 
the Fed, United States federal government will spend over up to, in its budget, to spend over a billion dollars now on the diabetes prevention program. So this is change at scale. A massive alteration in our investment in the prevention of type 2 diabetes. And oftentimes where CMS goes, private payers follow. And these types of payment models and value give us a path forward. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. We talked about the error of treating healthcare as a superstar game rather than one that's really dependent on soccer. I'm going to go to a different analogy here. Uh, for years, I really, my family and I, we loved American Idol. Um, this will go somewhere, um, you bear with me. On the left is Carrie Underwood, uh, multiple Grammy Award winner, one of the top selling country music artists of the 2000s. And on the right, does anybody know who that is? Can you call it out? That's Taylor Hicks. Awesome, we have a fan here. Taylor Hicks also won, and yet two, a, a year or so after he won, he put out an album, but his record label, Arista, dropped him. Why? They went through one of the most difficult vetting processes. They had millions of people vote on who they liked, and yet there's major discrepancies in who actually was going to be successful. For that matter, why don't couples who meet on The Bachelor stay together? Why don't individuals who impress Donald Trump and The Apprentice go on to become Fortune 500 CEOs? What is that problem? And I submit to you that we in medicine treat this the same way, and I call this the reality TV problem. Because the ostensible goal of reality TV is to identify the most talented recording artist, the most compatible couple, the best model, the best business person. Think about it in health. Ostensibly, the most important thing we do, and this sort of riffs on what you've just been hearing about, is we want that hyperactive first grader to grow up and somehow hold down a steady job and have a meaningful relationships with people. And yet, what's the real goal? It's not about actually that. It's about something in the middle. In reality, it's about ad dollars. It's getting television viewers. In healthcare, what do we have? We have checklists for symptom improvement. That's how drugs may be approved. What is this problem called? This is the problem of surrogate endpoints, which is that the thing we measure and the thing we incentivize is not the thing that really matters. And this is very, very true in healthcare. And this is one of the core reasons why you heard about meaningful composite quality metrics, but that is the exception rather than the rule. Many of the things that are measured and strongly incentivized are roundly seen as being exactly like what, we're, what is happening on American Idol and on The Bachelor, incentivizing the wrong short-term goal at the expense of the meaningful long-term goal. So how do we make this better? Well, one thing I want to just point out is, well, what are the pitfalls you fall into? Is that the surrogate endpoint, it, doesn't, it isn't related to the outcome that you actually care about. Just as impressing somebody uh, or going on um, uh, uh, sort of a show, impressing um, uh, the host there may not really be related to good business acumen. The other one is that the actual process itself is corrupting. For example, going on multiple nonstop dates in fancy locations does not reproduce what it's like to be in a real marriage. You get bad information. It actually is poisonous to a long-term success. The same thing can be said with this is why in the 1990s, when we looked at retrospective data to encourage um, women to be on hormone replacement therapy, thinking that it lowered cholesterol, it actually ended up increasing the rate of heart attack. The wrong surrogate endpoint was had in mind. How do we make this better? Because one of the most important problems that this section of our talk is going to focus on is how do we stop heart attacks? Here's the solution that we worked out, which is that rather than focusing on a blood pressure target, which is devoid of the context of a patient, maybe the patient doesn't want to be on a hypertensive medication because there are side effects they don't like, or maybe they really think that they want to stop smoking instead, or perhaps they want to focus on lowering cholesterol, there's a broader picture. That tool already exists. It's the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology 10-year risk calculator. Any of you can go online and find out your 10-year cardiovascular risk of heart attack or stroke if you're over the age of 40. What we did was say, well, this is terrific because you actually have a risk score. You know what you're, you know, we talk about personalized medicine. It's not all about genomics. It's about transparent, predictive, analytic models. And here's one that's existed. It is terrific. 
And not only that, we then in collaboration with the AHA and other researchers just earlier this year published in circulation, it was endorsed by the American Heart Association, the longitudinal risk calculator. So meaning that this is one of the apps that we created. If your initial risk in this hypothetical example is a 32% risk of heart attack or stroke in the next 10 years, you can say, well, you know what? I can't do all four things at one time. That's really hard for me. Why don't I do one or two things that I can actually handle? Maybe I'll focus on taking a daily aspirin, or maybe I'll really focus on re uh, reducing smoking. This is what patient preference looks like in action. This is what patient-centered care is that is actually catalyzed by the presence of data. The problem is we didn't pay for this before. So what we did uh, and my team put together when I was at CMS was this notion. Take an entire patient panel, calculate their 10-year cardiovascular risk. For those that are above 30%, we're going to put them all on a panel and average that risk together. Your job as a, cardi as a primary care doc is to lower that aggregate risk. So it's population health. It's an entire population. You know what your risk is. You know you have to get it down to over time. And it's very simple. You lower it two percentage points, you don't get anything. If you lower it from two to 10 percentage points, you get $5 per patient per month as a bonus, a couple thousand dollars a year. And if you do it more than 10 percentage points, in, in some, by the way, all of this is done through modifiable risk factors. This is not uh, dependent on age. Uh, we worked all those models out. Then you get $10 per patient per month. Will this work? So this is incentivizing that conversation. Uh, and right now, uh, this uh, went live early this year. It's the largest randomized trial of prevention ever done. There are it's a cluster randomized design, 500 centers in the US, and those are some of the locations. 3.3 million Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries are being randomized now. And then we'll have some results. Probably the first cut will be available, I believe, publicly later this year. And the rest will be available on an annual basis. But again, this is getting back to that problem. This is how you solve the reality TV problem. You create a surrogate endpoint that is actually a predicted risk of an important long-term outcome, and you incentivize change there. And you don't mess with all the little components of it, but you focus on that outcome in some way. This is the path forward to paying for long-term health and prevention. The third problem I want to talk about, and the third um, trap that we fall into, is that we think of data as being too complicated for people to understand. But the fact is, it's not that it's too complicated. It's that the ways in which we present it and the ways in which we talk about it with everyday people don't resonate. And I was particularly moved by this. I remember this is several years ago. In the disparity I saw in how the public responded to two different things that happened in 2009. This is the first. I, I enjoy watching, um, I, I'm a New England Patriots fan. Um, and uh, in 2009, something very funny happened. For some of you can see it. There was this big decision about whether or not um, the, the team should have gone for it on a fourth down where they had short yards against the Colts. They actually did go for it, they didn't make it, and the Colts came back and won the game. And the next day, and this is the point I'm making, the level of sophistication on ESPN, in the newspapers and on the blogs, in terms of the mathematical probabilities that was calculated was truly astonishing. And it's hard to see that right there, but that's the New York Times blog and a bunch of others. They calculated a bunch of probabilities. They said 78% versus 70 The point I'm making is that there is a tremendous appetite for people to actually wrestle with and understand complex data, debate it, and make it meaningful for themselves. And yet, why don't they do it for their own health care? This is, a, pay, this is a, a news report that came out literally the same week. This is some of the debate you heard about from Rita Redberg yesterday about mammography uh, at age 40 and whether or not uh, women should start undergoing it at age 40. And a federal panel said, no, wait until 50. The, there was such a disparity between the way people talked about the data from football versus the way they talked about the data from healthcare that next day. And I just had this imaginary sort of moment where I said, what if we ever talk, what if we talked about healthcare the way we talk about sports? So this is sort of a, a, a verbatim a quote taken from one of the articles that was published that day. It goes into, oh, the average woman turning 40, 1.4%. This is very hard to digest. What if we just presented it like this? If you're a woman who's 40 and you get an annual mammogram, what does that do? So if you don't get it, your batting average against breast cancer is 0.986. If you decide to undergo, then your batting average, so you is 0.987. 
And the possibility you're going to get hit by a pitch, meaning that you will have a biopsy that does not show any cancer that requires treatment is about, about 12.5%. You now know almost everything you need to know to engage in this debate. Should you have a mammogram? At least you can now have a conversation. And this may not be the best way to put it, but what if this is the way we talked about healthcare? So the last problem I want to talk about is the opioid crisis. Because the opioid crisis, to some extent, also can be substantially better with the presence of data. And I'm almost out of time, so I'm just going to take a second. Huge problem, hugely um, important. We at, where we are now at Optum Labs, we have access to 150 million claims, lives, and electronic health records. We created, using about 1,000 person hours, an entire framework to actually track the epidemic in each of these four areas. And we found that 45% of our initial prescriptions last year were not written in compliance with CDC guidelines. How do we make this data meaningful? Well, we mapped it. And take a look over here. Look at North Carolina, for example. If you work in North Carolina, and we talked to the North Carolina um, uh, state uh, uh, health folks and a few others, they have a significant problem with compliance with CDC guidelines. And if you blow it up, that's what it looks like. But that's a composite measure, much like the diabetes measure we looked at. Now let's delve down a little more. They actually generally seem to do pretty well with MME level prescriptions. Their problem is duration. This is a very different pattern than we see in some of the areas. So just as we have personalized medicine for people, we have personalized medicine for geography here. And one of the interventions made Optum Rx, one of the three largest pharmacy benefit managers, now has a policy that went live on July 1 that when prescriptions are written for more than seven days, they're automatically hard edited back down to seven. So the violations actually dropped by 80%, it's believed, based on preliminary data on, in July nationwide on the book of business that actually used op, that hard edit. So that is change at scale. Again, simply when data was made available and easier to talk about. So um, I thank you for your time and look forward to our discussion.